everybody. My name is Kathleen villiers Stuttle. I'm a writer and historian, and I'm delighted to be participating in this conference to commemorate Thomas Whelan and the events that took place at Clifton following his execution. I would like to thank Marie Mannion and Galway County Council for providing us with a platform to commemorate these events. My talk today is Clifton Town Ablaze, the aftermath of Thomas Whelan's execution. The shooting by the IRA of two RI seamen in Clifton on Wednesday, the 16th of March, 1921, was in retaliation for the execution of Thomas Whelan in Dublin two days earlier. The subsequent shooting of a, of a civilian and the serious wounding of another, along with the ransacking and burning of houses in the town, was the black and tan reprisal for the shootings. These events took place between 10 p.m. on Wednesday, the 16th of March, and 9 a.m. the following morning. These few hours in 1921 must surely have been the most frightening period ever experienced in the history of the town. Details on how these events played out can be found in several sources. Newspaper reports, evidence taken before a military inquiry held in Galway a week later, evidence given at, a, at the quarter session courts held in Uchtarard, Clifton and Galway over various dates between 1921 and 1923, the military service pensions files, and witness statements, interviews with members of the Connemara Flying Column recorded in the 1950s. Gathering the information from these various sources helps us construct a narrative of the night's events, but the accounts differ in some points, and this leaves some aspects of the story unclear. On Wednesday the 16th of March 1921, members of the Connemara Flying Column of the IRA gathered in a house in the outskirts of Clifton in preparation for an attack on the RIC in the town. The plan was to ambush the police patrol that usually rounded the town each evening. There are over 30 members of the Connemara Flying Column and this photograph shows just 11 of the volunteers. The column had spent the previous days at an ambush site on the Derry Lee Lake, east of the town on the Galway to Clifton Road, in the hope of encountering the RIC patrol on the road. For four days during daylight hours, they manned the ambush site, but no patrol appeared. It was then decided that they would uh, abandon the site and go into Clifton and confront the RIC in the town. The column had been formed just four months earlier and had yet to see action. The men moved out from the camp in the mountains on Tuesday evening, the 15th of March, traveling cross country to Clifton. But the night was dark and the ground was difficult and the RIC patrol had already left the streets of the town by the time they arrived there. They then withdrew to a safe house at Shanaheaver, north of Clifton, with the intention of returning again the following evening. Now, it's not known how many of the Clifton people knew that the uh, column was in the neighbourhood. Certainly some people did because they were using local guides. At between two and three in the morning, they moved from Shanaheaver to Clifton Lodge, a vacant house owned by Toby Joyce uh, and located about three quarters of a mile east of the town on the Galway Road known locally as Woods's. Here they waited out the day. At about 7.30 that evening, the head constable of Clifton RIC barracks sent four men out to patrol the town. The head constable, along with another constable, went onto the street at about 9.30 to check on the patrol. They made contact and then returned to the barracks. By that time, the IRA flying column was approaching the town. According to Peter MacDonald, Commandant of the West Connemara Brigade, there were 24 men in Clifton that night. And these are the names that he supplies. Shortly before 10 p.m., the column approached the town. Their scouts had informed them that there was a patrol of four or six policemen standing at E.J. King's pub on the corner of Market and Main Street. The column split in two, the majority of the men under the command of John King of Roundstone took up positions opposite the police barracks, while six others walked up Market Street towards E.J. King's corner. The six men chosen were considered to be the best shots and the most familiar with the layout of the town. They were P.T. Joe MacDonald, Brigade Commandant, Gerald Bartley, O.C. 4th Battalion, Clifton, Jack Fian, Brigade Quartermaster, Dick Joyce, Staff Captain, Michael Joyce, later Officer in Command of the 1st Battalion, Peter Wallace, also from the 1st Battalion, Linan. Of the six men, five were from Linan Battalion and one was from the Clifton Battalion. 
This is an early map of the town and I've marked out certain buildings that I've been mentioning during the talk. As you can see, Market Street and Main Street lead to EJ King's Corner, marked here in black. The Railway Hotel is located on the opposite side of the street. The Market House or Way House is in the centre of this, the road and also outlined in black. And at the end of Main Street, you will see the RIC barracks is also marked in black. And then right through the centre of the town, there's Market Hill Lane, which leads down to Main Street. There are several versions from various sources as to what took place on E.J. King's Corner that evening. According to P.T. MacDonald, the six men walked three abreast up Market Street to E.J. King's Corner. It would seem that they round the corner onto Main Street and found two RIC men leaning against the window. The first three approached the RIC, followed by the second three, a few yards behind. They were wearing long trench coats and had their hands in their pockets on their revolvers. The RIC men were on top of the policemen before they were noticed. One policeman reached for his gun, but it was too late. They were shot several times at point blank range. Constable Charles Reynolds was killed instantly. Constable Thomas Sweeney would die later from his wounds. Colonel Hackett, the proprietor of the railway hotel, was in his hotel on the opposite side of the street at the time of the attack. And on hearing gunfire, he switched off the lights and he looked out the window. He later told a reporter from the Connor Tribune that he saw the two bodies lying on the corner, on the corner opposite. Two men in trench coats came to the bodies and stooping over them, removed their guns and ammunition. A burst of gunfire was released from under the hotel window, he said, and the attackers ran off down the street. Some civilians came on the scene immediately afterwards, but quickly moved away. The RIC men tell it differently, although they don't even agree with each other in their evidence before the military inquiry and before the courts. There was some confusion as to where the other two policemen were at the time when Reynolds and Sweeney were shot. Reading through their evidence, which appears in the press, it is difficult to say where they were. Constable Finn, one of the two, gave evidence at the Uttarard Quarter Sessions in June. He told the court that the four policemen were standing at E.J. King's corner, two on each side of the street. The IRA men approached from the direction of the barracks. This would mean that they came down Main Street. They opened fire on Reynolds and Sweeney while he and his companion ran for cover at the Wayhouse in the centre of the street. They fired at three men who ran past them heading west. They followed the three towards the town hall but lost them. They returned to E.J. King's corner where they found two, their two companions lying on the road and they immediately ran to the barracks for help. Now if, as Constable Finn states, he and his companion rounded E.J. King's corner uh, from Main Street to Market Street, then they would have run into the IRA men who were, according to their statement, approaching from Market Street. Local people later said that some of the flying column were found were on Market Hill Lane that night. But whether this was before or after the shooting is unclear. Also, it's doubtful that the IRA would have been able to pick up the guns and ammunition of a falling policeman if they were uh, being fired on. So where were the other two RIC men? IRA statements made in the 40s and 50s, admittedly a long time after the event, state that the two RIC men had nipped into E.J. King's pub for a drink and were hiding the counter behind the counter when the firing started outside. Another version was that they were inside the railway hotel. At this stage, I don't think we'll ever really know the truth. Early press reports stated the police were fired on from houses in the town, but the local parish priest, Canon McAlpine, later repudiated this in a telegraph to the press and that the barracks had come under attack, but this was not confirmed. The parish priest, Canon McAlpine, was in bed when the police came knocking on his door at 10.30 p.m. Reynolds' body was still warm when he arrived at the barracks. He gave him absolution and anointed Sweeney. Dr. Casey later told the military inquiry into the shooting that Reynolds was already dead when he reached the barracks and Sweeney was suffering from hemorrhage and shock. Reynolds had several bullet wounds to his body. Constable Sweeney had been hit on both thighs and in the left leg. Following a quick examination by the doctor, Sweeney was bandaged and moved to the workhouse infirmary and Canna McAlpine returned to his house. 
Constable Charles O'Malley Reynolds was aged 32, a month short of his 33rd birthday. He was from Keena, County Longford, and had been a policeman for 14 years. He was married with a son, Thomas, who was just 18 months old, and Thomas was born in Clifton. Constable Sweeney, seen here standing, was just 24 years of age. He was from Ockram in County Galway. He was single and an ex-British soldier. He enlisted in the Irish Guards on the 6th of November, 1915, aged 18. He served in India and South Africa during the war and was demobbed in 1919. During the war, he had received a shrapnel wound in his left forearm. In his discharge papers, Sweeney put down policeman in Glasgow as his desired future employment when demobbed. Sadly, he'd never made it to Glasgow. He enlisted in the RIC on the 19th of November, 1920, and arrived in Clifton in January, 1921, two months before his shooting. Thomas Sweeney would die of his wounds in a Galway hospital the following evening. The cause of death for both Reynolds and Sweeney is given in their, on their death certificates as shock and hemorrhage result of gunshot wounds fired by persons unknown with murderous intent. The death certificates were released after the military court of inquiry held in Galway on the 23rd of March, 1921. After the attack, the police attempted to telegraph Galway for reinforcements, but the telegraph wires had been cut. A wireless message was eventually sent to Galway from the Marconi station at Derry Gimla. At 12.20 a.m., a special train departed Galway with three officers and 30 black and tans on board. A detachment of auxiliaries travelled by road. Two Galway doctors, Dr. Bill Sands and Surgeon Michael O'Malley, travelled by private car and arrived in Clifton at about 6 a.m. A special train pulled into Clifton station at about 4 a.m. and the Black and Tans immediately began raiding houses of known Sinn Féin supporters and IRA sympathisers. The same houses and business premises had been searched several times in recent months, so the occupants knew what to expect. But this time the Crown forces went beyond searching and looting. In those days, the owners of business premises and their families lived up over the shop. The sound of gunfire and explosions was the first that many people knew that something was happening on the street. The people moved to the backs of their houses to avoid stray bullets from the street. As the Black and Tans and police broke through the front doors, the menfolk of the house tried to make their escape out the back. The raids continued for hours and several shops and public houses were broken into and as time passed, the Black and Tans began drinking and setting fires to the buildings. At about 6 a.m. there was a second knock at, at on Canon McAlpine's door. This time it was a parishioner declaring, for God's sake, Canon, come down, the town's ablaze. McAlpine came into the town and found several buildings on fire. Uh, the Crown forces were up and down the street, he later told the press. Alexander MacDonald's Hotel on Main Street was one of the first to be set on fire and was completely destroyed by the time McAlpine reached the street. Two small houses at the rear of the hotel, occupied by MacDonald's nieces, were also destroyed. A further eight premises, two on Main Street and six on Market Street, were burnt down that morning. The houses are marked here in red. On Main Street, William Clancy's pub, close to the RIC barracks, and P.K. Joyce's butcher shop, almost directly opposite. On Market Street, Bartley King's pub and drapery, located on the south side of the street, Bertie King's shop and John M. Lydon's pub next door. And further down the street, Mikey Manning's pub, and below that, Mrs. Bartley's cafe and restaurant, which occupied two houses, were all destroyed. Mrs. Bartley was the widow of an RIC sergeant, and her sons, Gerald and Paul, were part of the flying column that had been in the town earlier. Given how the burning houses were scattered throughout the town, it seems amazing that more houses didn't catch fire that morning. MacAlpine was accosted by one of the Black and Tans and with a rifle pointed in his chest, was told to get off the street. But one of the Irish police, and that's how he describes them, intervened on his behalf. At some point during the early morning, John Joe MacDonald was shot on, uh, on Main Street, close to his father's hotel. 
and his next door neighbour and cousin, Peter Clancy, was left wounded. Press reports state that Macdonald was running near or towards the family hotel when shot. But here again, it's difficult to say exactly what happened, as we only have the evidence of the policeman. There were no civilians present at the time of his shooting. A witness before the military inquiry on the 23rd of March, held in Galway, an unnamed black and tan stated that at about 5.15 a.m., he and four constables came around E.J. King's corner to Main Street, where they saw a man leave a house on the other left-hand side of the road. They twice called on him to halt, and he continued to run down the street. They fired but missed him. He then crossed the street, and as he came to the entrance of Market Hill Lane, next to his father's hotel, a revolver shot was fired, and MacDonald fell to the footpath. They went to him, but he was already dead. They searched for the person who fired the shot, but they couldn't find any trace of him. At the second sitting of the military inquiry held in Galway on the 29th of April, a sergeant stated that he was in charge of six men of the RIC and they were on Market Hill Lane when they heard shots of halt. A civilian ran past, they fired and he fell to the ground. Now there are so many holes in both those stories that really they, they don't bear considering. And unfortunately, we don't have time today to debate them. McDonald's body lay on the footpath outside Ward's shop for some time before Dr. Casey came on it. On first inspection, he saw that McDonald was lying on his back, was fully dressed, and had been shot in the back of the head. McDonald's remains were removed to the workhouse infirmary and were brought to the church that afternoon. He was buried in our bare cemetery the following day, Friday the 18th. John Joe MacDonald was 31 years of age. His father, Alex MacDonald, was, according to the press, a pathetic figure at the funeral. He had lost his home, business, and what seems to have been his only child in one night. John Joe had served in the Great War as a Sergeant Major in the 5th Battalion of the Connacht Rangers. He was discharged on the 29th of September, 1919. Both his father and grandfather were well-known marble sculptors. I've come across several mentions of their work in Connemara Marble, making small souvenirs that were sold in their hotel. John Joe's occupation on his death certificate is given as dealer. Presumably this is cattle dealer. The cause of death is recorded as shock and hemorrhage caused by gunshot wounds fired by the police in the execution of their duty. This is the evidence of the military court inquiry of inquiry on the 29th of April, 1921. Peter Clancy, a retired policeman living and working in his brother Patrick's shop, shown here on the right. The shop was next door to McDonald's Hotel. The front of the shop was set on fire with petrol in the early hours of the morning. At daybreak, Peter was in the shop examining the damage when three black and tans entered the premises. Peter had retired from the RIC in 1911 after 11 years of service. He later told the press that he was not alarmed when the men took him into the back of the, of the pub in the backyard. He thought he was going to be searched. They placed me against the wall, he told the reporter, told me to put up my hands. I did so. The man with the revolver told me to go down on my knees. When I had knelt down, four shots were fired at me at close range. The first bullet passed through his left tonsil and out the right side. The second passed through his lower jaw and clipped the tip of his tongue on its way out. The third bullet passed through the mouth from side to side, chipping the teeth as it passed. The blackened hands left him for dead, but he managed to get to his wife and the doctors were called. Clancy and Sweeney were transported to Galway in the same army lorry later that day. Sweeney was delivered to St. Bride's Hospital, where he died the following day, and Clancy to the county hospital. Needless to say, Clancy was traumatised by the experience. He would spend three months in hospital. It was nothing short of a miracle that he survived the terrible wounds he received, Dr. O'Malley later told the court. He was a physical wreck, O'Malley said. A nervous wreck was how Dr. Casey described him to the same court. Peter Clancy would never fully recover from this ordeal. These photographs are some of the burnt houses 
They appeared in the Irish Independent the following week. The photo at the top right hand corner is John M. Leibniz's shop. And the bottom on the left is uh, McDonald's Hotel. And on the right is uh, Mikey Manning's pub, the Arch Bar. As the dawn broke on St. Patrick's Day, slogans appeared on the walls. God save the King was written across Clancy's door. Clifton will remember and so will the RIE was written across Gorham's shop front. Shoot another member of the RIC and up goes the town was another. The streets were empty. Many of the townspeople had fled and had taken refuge at the workhouse and the convent. A detachment of auxiliaries arrived and they brought the blackened hands under control. The auxiliaries went about telling the people it was safe and, to, and encouraging them to return to their homes. Word reached the town that two houses in the outskirts had also been attacked and burnt. These were Matty Joyce's on the Westport Road and Tommy Guilfoyle's on the Sky Road. Thomas Whelan's family home was also searched, but thankfully was not set alight. Following MacDonald's burial on Friday the 18th, Constable Reynolds' body was moved to the church. Canna McAlpine was unaware that Thomas Sweeney had died in Galway when he spoke at devotions Friday evening. He extended his condolences to the wife of Constable Reynolds. He condemned the shooting of Reynolds and MacDonald and asked the people as a favour to him and as a tribute of respect to a good man's memory to attend Reynolds' funeral in large numbers the next day. On Saturday, a large crowd followed Constable Reynolds' coffin from St. Joseph's Church to the railway station where it departed Clifton on the midday train. A large wreath was sent from the people of the town and another from the local members of the force. The coffins of Reynolds and Sweeney were brought together at Galway. Constable Sweeney's coffin draped in the Union Jack and mounted on a police lorry was taken from the hospital through the streets to the station. The cortege was led by a band of the 17th Lancers with muffled drums and included a company of auxiliaries, a large body of RIC and a number of townspeople. Constable Sweeney's father, whose face, according to the newspapers, was swollen with weeping, was joined in a railway carriage by Elizabeth Reynolds, wife of Constable Reynolds. The coffins were placed on board the train for their final journey east. Constable Sweeney to be buried in Ockram and Constable Reynolds to be buried in Longford. But the casualties of the night didn't end there. John M. Lydon was still in bed when his shop and pub had come under attack in the early hours of the morning. The family lived on the second floor of the premises. Lydon managed to escape, but fearing he would be arrested, he went into hiding for a time. His condition worsened, and in the weeks that followed, he died on the 12th of May, four months after the attack. He was aged 65. The Leiden family view John's death as another casualty of that day. Dublin Castle was informed of events taking place in Clifton with them by a series of telegrams that went out on Thursday morning, the 17th. And this is a summary of the content from the official files. The impression given is that MacDonald was uh, trying to escape when shot and that Peter Clancy was shot by persons unknown. The police were fired on from houses in the town and the exchange that followed. And in the exchange that followed, several houses were burnt and others were damaged. On the 7th of April, questions were asked by the chief secretary in the House of Commons about events taking place in Clifton. The chief secretary gave a reply similar to that shown here, emphasizing that the burning of the houses was not done in retaliation by the police. He was asked to explain how the firing of rifles could possibly set houses on fire. And he gave a vague sort of unsatisfactory reply. And I quote, you cannot have an encounter of this kind without something of this sort. Compensation claims were brought against Galway County Council for damages caused by the IRA and by the Crown Forces. They came before the quarter session courts held in Uchtarard, Clifton and Galway over various dates between 1921, 22 and 23. Compensation was awarded and in time, the burnt houses were repaired or rebuilt. However, none of the original families live in those houses today, although some descendants of these families can be found in the district. St. Patrick's Day is commemorated in Clifton each year with religious services and a parade in the town. 
The emphasis is on fun and community and far removed from the terror that marked the day 100 years ago, 1921. There is, of course, a great deal more that could be said on this topic, but time is running out and I must finish. My principal sources for today's talk, the newspapers, the pension files, the witness statements can, are all available online and the web addresses, the website addresses are given here. And I cover the topic in my book, Beyond the Twelve Bends, which is available in my own website, Connemara Girl Publications, and my email address is given here too. Thank you very much. Bye bye. <laughs>